Well, uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon's colloquium. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Susan Altbeg, who is uh, today's colloquium speaker. As you can already see, there's going to be, you know, there's a mesmerizing movie going on behind me, so <laughs> which bodes very well for the talk. Uh, so, um, Susan Altweg, she is a professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, she has spent most of her career there. Uh, she did her PhD in Basel in physics, and after a short stint of a couple of years in New York, uh, she moved to Bern, where she has been uh, ever since. Uh, so, one of the, the really uh, I mean, breathtaking recent successes in planetary science uh, is the Rosetta mission to Comet 67P, and I think the most exciting results, and I don't think I'm too biased here, uh, came from the Rosina, Rosina instrument, which uh, Catherine was the PI for. So I think that's going to be uh, what a lot of this talk is about, and I am very excited uh, to see the results. Uh, so Catherine, please. OK, good, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I'm also very honored to be here, I have to admit. This uh, movie you just saw, you can download them. If you have children, grandchildren, do that. Show them to them. They love it, and they are scientifically correct. <laughs> so just Google Rosetta uh, cartoon, and you will get at least seven cartoons covering the full mission from launch to the end. If you show them the end, make sure that you are there, because they will cry. <laughs> but uh, this afternoon I'm not <laughs> showing <laughs> any more cartoons. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I will talk about the science of Rosetta. Rosetta was named for this stone here. It's the Rosetta stone found by the troops of Napoleon in Egypt. And it has in three languages the same text, in hieroglyphs, in Egyptian demotic, and in Greek demotic. And with the help of this stone, hieroglyphs could be deciphered. And uh, of course, the goal of Rosetta was a very small goal, just decipher the origin of the solar system, the Earth and life, by studying a small body four kilometers in size. With Rosina, we tried to do that uh, through the chemical composition of the comet. So we looked at species, we looked at isotopologues, and each species tells its own tale. If you talk about chemistry, then of course you have starting conditions, and we have the starting conditions in, for comets in the interstellar medium, and the rest is just chemistry. So, <laughs> and chemistry, of course, depends on some physical conditions like density, temperature, time, uh, cosmic rays, UV, and whatever. But in principle, it's just chemistry. Rosetta was uh, three tons when it was launched, half of it more than half was full. Ten scientific instruments on board, one lander with another <laughs> nine instruments on board. The payload was 160 kilograms, the lander an additional 100 kilograms on Earth, one gram on the comet because of gravity. It was launched in 2004, flew by the Earth, then Mars, Earth again. The first asteroid, asteroid Steins, four kilometers in diameter, then again Earth and the second asteroid, Lutetia, which has 100 kilometers across. Finally to arrive at the comet 67P in 2014. We uh, saw the first glimpse of the comet in March 2014. It was one pixel. And then by June it was more than one pixel. It still looked quite ordinary, but then in July it started to uh, look quite extraordinary. And by August we were at the same vol velocity as the comet. So we flew by with the comet 
And the relative speed was roughly one meter per second, so you could easily walk along Rosetta. In October 2014, that's a selfie made by, uh, by Rosetta. You see the solar panels, that's the structure here. Here is the lander, and, and the lander with one of the cameras made this picture with the comet. So that's what we call selfie. On 12th November 2014, the lander was put on the comet. Not one landing, but actually four. And then in February 2015, we flew six kilometers above the surface. And you see that's the shadow of Rosetta. It's the first spacecraft picture, making a picture of its own shadow. This was the uh, very interesting period of perihelion. Perihelion was actually in August 2015. The peak activity was then beginning of September, end August, beginning of September. And then we flew again out with the comet and in September 2016 at 3.8 AU we crash landed Rosetta on the comet on purpose, <laughs> not by accident. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> Rosetta was actually the third cornerstone of four cornerstones of the Rosetta uh, Plan Horizon 2000. It's clearly the closest encounter ever with a comet. The first mission was put the land, not the projectile, on the comet. And we, the, the important thing for Rosetta is that we encountered it at almost 4 AU. We flew through the perihelion at 1.25 AU and then out again to 4 AU the first time. And of course, it's, it was a very big challenge for flight dynamics. You see here from the orbits. If you are at the comet, you cannot just go around and around and around like Mars. You have to actively uh, direct your spacecraft, unless you are very close to the comet, then gravity is high enough so that you have uh, orbits like around the moon. But most of the time we had to, to fly quite uh, interesting shapes here. In March 2015, at about 2.5 AU, the sky looked like this. Rosetta was, uh, got the attitude from looking at the sky, taking uh, star maps and comparing it to, to uh, star maps in the memory. And then it knew how it would look like, it, where it would look. Now stars, that's a star, that's, that's, and that's, and that's, and all the rest is cometary dust. So Rosetta had a big problem. <laughs> Where are the stars? Where do I look? And we had to retreat from the comet. We were at six kilometers in February. We had to retreat to 400 kilometers during perihelion. That's the comet here. You see it has a rotation period of roughly 12 hours. When we arrived, it was 12.4. When we left, it was just 12 hours. So it sped up. That's uh, non-gravitational forces from the gas leaving the comet. Uh, it's four kilometers, that's the longest dimension here. Uh, as I said, perihelion is 1.25 AU, and it, the rotation axis is tilted. So it has summer and winter. It has in the north a long cold summer during aphelion, a uh, summer lasting five and a half years. And in the south, it has a hot, short summer lasting only 10 months, but during perihelion. And that makes two very distinct uh, hemispheres. If you look at the comet, we, we had a camera, we had a good camera, could even make uh, colors, but it doesn't help. It just looks black and white, even in color. So it has very little colors. In the infrared, you see an absorption band here at 3.2 micron, and uh, otherwise it's, it's nothing, it's, it's just dust. Porosity is, is very high, 75%, and density is very low, and the albedo is, is very low. Absorption features water ice? No, no, I will come to the 
or it can feature later. Here, the, these are the two lobes. So it has two lobes. It's a two-lobed uh, comet, and we got two for one because these are two separate comets, as people find out. That's the small lobe, and that's the big lobe. And here you see onto the summer hemisphere, and here you see onto the winter hemisphere. And you see it's very different. It's not the lobes which are different. It's summer hemisphere and winter hemisphere, or north and south, which are different. The north is covered by fine dust, sometimes bigger boulders, boulders but a lot of fine dust. And the south is uh, that sintered ice. It's ice and dust mixed, and probably more or less sintered. So people found out that Julia uh, Mofgerasimenko is made out of two comets which gently collided. There is still a discussion when this happened. It could happen as recently as one billion years. It could have happened much earlier. This we don't know. Here again, north and south. It has cliffs. That's a cliff about a thousand meter height. If you now look at the dust, we looked at it in all dimensions, starting from the four kilometer dust we have here. Uh, so that's Osiris. Then we have a hundred meters if you look from closer up. 2 meters, 10 centimeters, that's done from the land. You see the foot of the land. And then down to uh, 1 centimeter size and to 200 micrometers, that's done with the Cosima, the dust mass spectrometer. In all dimensions, it's fractal. And that's the atomic force microscope. And even down here, the dust is fractal. It's not one piece, it's always composed of smaller pieces. And that was probably surprising. We measured, of course, in the coma. We didn't go to the nucleus except at the very end of the mission. That's measured with the COPS instrument, which measures the total pressure and the ramp pressure. And that's the total pressure here. And you see nicely, it goes up and down. Uh, that's the diurnal variation, because the area you are facing from the spacecraft varies with the rotation of the comet. And then we, here we are over the summer hemisphere, and here we are over the winter hemisphere. So the coma is not homogeneous. It's, it really varies, depending on where you are. And this here is from the infrared experiment. That's water coming out here. And at the same time, that's CO2 coming out here. That was early in the mission. Early in the mission, CO2 came out in the winter hemisphere and water from the summer hemisphere. Really a heterogeneity, probably due to evolution of the surfaces. <coughs> These are jets seen uh, during perihelion. You see the diverse jets here. Some are very narrow, like this here. Some are much broader. The broad jets are m most probably due to cliff collapses, cliffs which just fall over. And it, this was seen live from Osiris, cliffs falling over. Here it's dominated by, by uh, water. The gas is dominated by water. And this here is, we, we don't yet understand this phenomena. It's short-lived. It's less than half an hour, and then it's gone again. And it's dominated by CO2. It's something like a pressure cooker. It makes, then, then that's it. It was quite interesting to see. And that shows you. You see here the CO2 versus H2O. And these indicate the latitudes and longitudes where we measured it. And you see they match, at least some of them match the outbursts seen by Osiris by the camera. And so that's driven by CO2. But 
But now let's go into chemistry. And the first thing we do, let's look at isotopes. We had two mass spectrometers. One was a high resolution mass spectrometer with a resolution of roughly 9,000 at the 50% level, 3,000 at the 1% level. That's the FMS, and most of the results are from the FMS. The other one was a time of flight instrument with less uh, resolution, but much faster uh, in measuring. So water and its isotopologues. We detected HDO and also the doubly deuterated water in the comet. And just uh, D1 is then the singly deuterated, D2 is the doubly deuterated. These are the measurements made with DFMS. On mass 19, we have 18OH, which is a fragment of water, of course. We have the H217O and the HDO. And then on 20, we have uh, H218O and the D2O. And here, uh, that's another uh, molecule where we have the deuterated species, it's H2S. From these measurements, we got a very high D over H value of 5.3 times 10 minus 4, so more than three times higher than terrestrial, more than three times higher than Hartley 2, which is also a Jupiter family comet. And this uh, shattered a little bit the series we had about comets. <laughs> you see, most of the Oort cloud comets have values around 3 here. Now, meanwhile, we have uh, Lovejoy, where we have one terrestrial value. It's also an Oort cloud, but there is a second value. I don't know which one is correct here. And then we have Hartley 2, which is terrestrial. And on the other hand, we have 67P. What does it mean? If you look at this picture here, we have the... You know, when I started in cometary science, that was before Chotto, before the Halley mission, um, the, all comets came from the Oort cloud. It was very easy. Uh, and then somebody invented the Kuiper belt, which was a bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then the scatter disk. And by now, we actually don't know where comets <coughs> come from. But... Uh, at this time, the idea was that Oort cloud came from within Neptune and Kuiper belt comets came from outside of Neptune. And the D over H, the difference in D over H was explained by this formation at different uh, regions. I think we can just forget about that. Comets, they probably formed from here to here. And uh, then it's just dynamical history, if they ended up in the Kuiper belt or if they ended up in the Oort cloud. And by now we know that uh, from the Oort cloud you can become a centaur, then a Jupiter family comet, you can go out again in the Oort cloud or in the Kuiper belt, whatever. So it's not so easy to, to trace back where a comet comes from. Uh, several people said that what we measure does not represent the bulk of the comet, the D over H. We uh, published it very early in the mission when we were still far from the sun. But I can assure you these are now different periods when we repeated the measurements of D over H and this uh, value persists of the whole mission. Now look at D2O to HDO. That's 1.8%. So that's even much higher. What does this mean? There is a paper by Furuya. He explains it by, by this uh, layered dust grain chemistry. So water in the first uh, place uh, forming on the dust, where you still have most of the oxygen in the gas phase. And you form uh, a little bit of HDO and you form much less of the doubly deuterated version. And then later on in the COC uh, methanol rich phase, you form much more of the doubly deuterated. So that's dust grain chemistry. 
and he modeled this then for the protoplanetary or the protoplanetary disk here the, how it evolves and you see in the that's the solid phase the solid line is the solid phase it's easy and that's the gas phase so D2O to H2O goes up in the solid phase and it stays more or less constant drops a little bit after some uh, far out here but anyhow the D2O to H2O is much bigger than the H2O to H2O Statistically, you would expect one force. So, the W deuterated, the singly deuterated should be one force <coughs> of the singly deuterated to the normal water. And what we measure is, is 17, not one force. In the protosol nebula, what you do, you do exchange of isotopes. So, water reacts with the W deuterated to give uh, HDO. This decreases efficiently the W deuterated. It doesn't change really the HDO because there is not enough of this W deuterated. But if you measure 17, it means you didn't have this reaction here. And that means water was never in the gas phase in the protoplanetary disk. It stayed as ice coming from the uh, pre-stellar stage. Otherwise, you, you would lower this value to one force. And the difference between comets could now be uh, the location where they were formed. If they were formed further in, like Hartley II, he may have uh, gotten quite a lot of light water. So this lowers this value of uh, HDO. If you have a comet like 67P, it was probably formed further out. So that's an indication for pre-stellar ice in comets. We have another, a few other deuterated species, like the HDS, which I already showed. It's also enhanced, even more so than water. The NH3, that's still unpublished, but it's very similar to H2S here. And uh, methanol, it's also unpublished. It's even much more enhanced. It's 1.8 percent. Now you have to divide this by four because you have four H's. So that's roughly five times 10 to minus three for the D over H if you want to compare it. We have found a, a few more uh, non-solar isotopic values, silicon. We measure volatiles, but we also measured silicon, and silicon is spotted by solar wind into the coma, and then we measure it. And you see that uh, silicon 29 to 28, and here is 20, uh, 30 to 28, and the bulk is non-solar. It's one sigma, it's not two sigma, but... At the same time, we could also do the 13C to 12C for in CO, which is actually the same mass here. Uh, it's mass 29 to mass 28, and the C is very much solar. So it shows you that it's not an instrumental effect. Sulfur. Sulfur we measured in, in many uh, molecules. And in three, we could measure both uh, all three sulfur isotopes, so 33, 34, and 32. All of them are non-solar. Solar would be here. They are depleted in the heavy ones. Um, we also have 34 for OCS here. And for which one? CS2? No, CS2 we have up here. Uh, so they are all non-solar here. They're definitely depleted and the bulk is non-solar. It's clearly not due to photodissociation. That would be here the blue line. It's not due to mass fractionation, would be the green line. Um, and well, the, the, the standard is the VCDT <coughs> meteorite. I don't know if that is a good standard, but if we take that as standard, then comets are different. 
One of our nicest measurements is the xenon. Xenon, uh, we have nine isotopes, and we have detected seven of them. And they really uh, tell you uh, where the material comes from. There is no chemistry involved in xenon. <laughs> or at least very little. It's not none, but it's very little. <laughs> And you see that uh, 124, 126 are due to P processes, then you have S process and R process. The heavy ones are due to R processes here. Our Earth is a strange case. Uh, that, uh, they call it xenon paradox in the Earth, because the Earth is missing xenon. If you look at the noble gases, and compare it with chondrites, then we are clearly missing xenon. And xenon is the heaviest one of the noble gases. Why should we miss it? We cannot lose it. It's too heavy. So the explanation here is that you can ionize xenon much better than the others, and then you lose it in the atmosphere much better than as iron, you lose it better than as neutral. On the other hand, uh, if we look at the isotopes in our atmospheric xenon, you see we have, uh, we have a clear trend here. That would be solar, and that's the Earth uh, xenon. We have too much of the heavy isotope. So we lose the heavy noble gas, but we have too much of its heavy isotopes. That's the paradox. Strange. Now, this can be explained by uh, mass fractionation. And this you can correct. This peak at 129 comes from iodine 129 decay. And people claim that you can use this for the Earth's atmosphere as a clock, how fast the Earth's mantle was formed. Um, I think this clock is now gone. If you correct for the mass fractionation, then your xenon in the at Earth's atmosphere will look like this. And all of a sudden, you miss the heavy isotopes. If you correct for it, and it's exactly 40 years ago that Pepin and Finney postulated the U xenon. U not for uranium, U standing for the German word Ur, primordial, uh, primordial uh, xenon. People were looking for xenon, for this primordial xenon, for the U xenon, and never found it. Not in meteorites, not on Mars, not on the moon, not, nowhere. Uh, until 67P. If we take uh, the isotopic ratio from 67P, then we get this blue curve. And now you compare it to the U xenon, and you get, as an extra, you also get the, the, the peak at 129. So we fit exactly, with 22% cometary xenon, we fit exactly our atmospheric xenon. And that tells you how many comets impacted the Earth. It's about 1% of the water. Of the water, yes. It's not much, but it's important for noble gases. It also agrees with argon, what we see. So the summary is D over H is heavily enriched. Uh, C12 is slightly enriched. A little bit here in CO2, where we have the best value. <coughs> It's depleted in the heavy isotopes for sulfur uh, 34, 33. It's a little bit depleted in silicon. We have one value for the N in NH3. It's heavily enriched. Uh, it's the same as HCN for comets and CN for comets. And xenon is depleted in the heavy isotopes. Not in all, but in the heavy. Now let's go on to molecular uh, composition. You can also f learn something about the origin of the cometary material by looking at molecules. 
And one molecule is O2. That was our biggest surprise when we saw O2. I closed my eyes and said, my, uh, my instrument is not working. <laughs> Must be something wrong. And then after three months, I opened them again, and it was still there. So I had to deal with it. Um, it's the fourth most abundant molecule in the comet. So water, CO2, CO, and then O2. It's quite abundant. It follows extremely well the water. The blue is water here. That's time when we were going away from the sun. Water was decreasing and oxygen was decreasing in parallel. So it's, it's very well embedded in water. And there are now two uh, valid explanations, I think. One is uh, by radiolysis from the cometary ice, but it must have happened before comet formed, because it's not only on the surface, it's, it's also in the interior. And, or uh, it's gas phase chemistry in the uh, dark molecular clouds, or hot cores. Or so. so there are papers by Tocke and Moses. There are two explanations which do not explain the, what we see. One is the Eli Riedel mechanism. So you have water ions impinging on the comet surface and then uh, transforming into O2. This is certainly a mechanism which can work, but by far not enough uh, O2. And the other one, you do it when you uh, sublimate water, you transform it into H2O2 during sublimation and then into O2. Again, this can uh, explain a tiny part of what we see, but not more. And the other molecule we found is, so actually the, the O2 uh, also tells you probably that the ice was uh, preserved. Otherwise, you would not have this uh, parallel uh, behavior of water and O2. It was in the water ice and it stayed in the water ice. Uh, the other one is sulfur. Sulfur is a little bit of a mystery because uh, it's depleted in star-forming regions, as you probably know better than I do. It's there in the interstellar medium in cosmic abundance, and it's there again in comets. But in between, it, it miss, it's missed a little bit. So uh, uh, I think it's an observational bias because... Uh, Astronomers don't see it from remote, and that's maybe because uh, a lot of the H2S is converted by radiolysis into uh, refractory sulfur or semi-refractory sulfur. We see S2, we see S3, we see S4, and most probably there is also S8, which we don't see because it's not volatile, so it will not come off, but we see all these three sulfur species. S2 itself is very easily destroyed. Within 30 seconds at 1 AU, you destroy S2. And the fact that we still see it means it had to stay in the ice. Again, pre-stellar ice. So we have a very rich chemistry in sulfur. Uh, most of it is in H2S but we have a lot of atomic sulfur. This also points to this radiolysis in, in the ice. And then we have the organosulfur here. So the conclusion from this is chemistry, well, first of all, the protosolar nebula was, was not well mixed. You didn't have a washing machine which mixed everything, otherwise you wouldn't have non-solar isotopic ratios in comets. And probably the protosolar chemistry was not very important for comets. They uh, represent mostly pre-solar uh, ice. So where did they form? I don't know. <laughs> um, the best explanation so far I, I got from Erwin van Dishoek. Um, they observed with ALMA these, these uh, heterogeneities in disks, where you have large dust grains in one sector only, 
and here you have to find us and it's explained as um, pressure pumps it's called so you get large dust here and this could be the comet factory where you actually build comets and then it's not a mixture of everything what you have in comets but just of one sector of but uh, I'm not a specialist in that if we look at organics I'm not the chemist I'm sorry <laughs> and uh, as a non-chemist as a physicist I always forget um, how these molecules look like, how they are called. And, and so I, when, when we detected more than a few molecules, I started to build a zoo. And then I can remember. Let's start here with the butterfly. Well, the zoo is built on water, that's clear. It's, it's, it's water. With the butterflies, these are the very volatile molecules. We have found N2, not too much, but it's clearly there. Oxygen, as I said, what is in white we knew before in comets, so mm -hmm. CO and CO2, of course. Then we have uh, small molecules, like th these are the poisonous ones. And then, of course, as I told you, uh, we have a lot of stinky molecules, all the sulfur that stinks here and also here. S2 is bluish, S3 is uh, orange, and S4 is reddish, which gives you the frog. Uh, and, and methanthiol smells of swamp. So that's uh, this chemistry here. We have the funny um, molecules, the alcohols, up to pentanol. You drink ethanol, don't drink the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the giraffes the long carton chains, up to at least heptane, probably octane. Um, these are exotic birds. These are molecules where I don't know where to put them. <laughs> but I learned that the ethylene glycol and propylene glycol are anti-freezing agents. But the comet, I can assure you, is frozen. And then we have the heavy ones elephants. We found some uh, PAHs, benzene, one ring, toluene, with a CH3, uh, benzoic acid, and the heaviest one was naphthalene. No methane? Methane, that's... Uh, oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's here. Yeah, that's not the ring. These are the rings. And that's the chains. Cyanogene, <laughs> um, that's a chameleon because it was always hiding in the spectrum. Then we have some uh, non-volatiles. These are the oysters with pearls in them, like the isotopes. And what else? Then the halides here. Meanwhile, we also have CH3Cl and we have the pint of phosphorus. Phosphorus is, is here. And the parent of phosphorus seems to be PO. We have a clear signature for, C, uh, for PO. <laughs> and no PH3, no PN, no PC, no P anything. So. Then we have the uh, peacocks. They are noble and solitary. So argon, krypton, xenon. And we have zebras. Zebras, they all smell of horse manure. And they are, of course, the food for, for lions. And if you take methylamine and CO2, you form glycine. So that's my zoo. And then we have the whale. That's uh, the animal from the Cosima team, the dust mass spectrometer. They see uh, carbon hydrogen bearing molecules, refract refractories resembling the uh, insoluble organic matter seen in, in meteorites. So that's the whale here, the big one. We are not at the end here. <laughs> so uh, hydrocarbons I talked about. 
as you know, the comet is very black. So if this is black, this is the comet. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it has very low bead on no colors, um, nothing in the UV. Little features in the infrared, as I showed. And Capaccioni, they uh, claimed that this dip you see at 3.2 uh, micron is due to a mixture of carbon hydrogen and oxygen hydrogen chemical groups. And then Quirico from the same uh, measurements said that it's uh, opaque minerals and semi-volatile organics and they claim it could be ammonium salt. Ptolemy, that was the mass spectrometer on the land. Of course, they didn't get a sample from the drill. They just got some dust which <laughs> sprang up on landing. But they also claim it's uh, uh, CH2 and O. They have not a very good mass resolution. And, and also Cosima, the, the dust mass spectrometer, they didn't see really organic uh, molecules. They just saw this signature for the veil. So why is it black, this comet? Shortly before the end of the mission, three weeks before the end, uh, the spacecraft was hit by dust. And we, we really saw it in our iron source, that's uh, the COPS, the, the iron gauge. And you see all of a sudden it sprang up and had some wild features. That's the gauge which looks in the comet direction. So really the pressure went up at that time. And we got a huge amount of signals here. Don't try to read it. <laughs> That's a part of it. And you see on every integer mass we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaks. So that this we, we are still uh, doing <laughs> the analysis. What we have done is we have fitted the individual peaks and then sorted them by uh, functional groups. So these are molecules and fragments which contain only C and H. So one C, two Cs, three Cs, and then a number of Hs here. Uh, that's CHO, so it contains at least one, uh, just one O, not at least, just one. CHN and CHS. Now, if you look here, you see it decreases with mass. Here, it's not that clear. It levels out. And I think that's because of the ring molecules. Starting at mass 78, uh, you start to have rings. So that's what we see here. Uh, CH and CHO bearing molecules are as abundant. They, the abundance is... is uh, very similar of the two, whereas CHN are much less abundant and so is CHS. And then uh, we try to, to, our instrument, uh, it shoots electrons on the uh, molecules to ionize them and of course it fragments them. And we try to account our peaks to the fragmentation patterns we know. And that's done for all the uh, aliphatic compounds we have and also for the ring molecules we have. And you see what remains white here is not accounted for. That means we can account for practically all C2s here. That's okay. We cannot account for C and as it's a uh, logarithmic scale it's, it's one third of the C is not accounted for. Almost one half of the C is not accounted for. And then starting here, most of, of the signal we have is not accounted for by these chains or rings, by saturated chains or rings. So our conclusion is that this is a lot of unsaturated molecules. So molecules which are, uh, are just not <laughs> hydrogenated to the end. That's work in progress. <coughs> if we now compare to the dust uh, that has been published by, by Bartin in 2017, it's uh, our comet, Halley and Will 2. 
they are very much alike. There is no big surprise here. But if you look at this here, the atomic uh, weight um, number is evenly distributed between C, O, and H. The weight is mostly in the O and in the C, and there is some silicon. And then if you divide this into uh, really refractories, what we call minerals, and then organics, of course, oxygen is, is in both, is in minerals and in organics, C is in both. Then you come up that 45% of the dust, of the refractory dust, is organic. Not minerals, just organic. And I think together with, with this here, we just have a, a continuous uh, flow from the very volatiles up to the macromolecules. And that's what we see here with this unsaturated. I think we found uh, ammonium salt. On this 5th of September, before the impact, OH was much bigger than NH3. And then three hours later, NH3 was much bigger than OH. In fact, 200 was the difference. All over the mission, NH3 and water were in parallel. So when water went up, NH3 went up, and so on, except here. All of a sudden, we have much more NH3, and this is in the dust, must be in the dust. Why should NH3 be in the dust? Um, if you look carefully in mass 18, well, first you see the fifth in NH3, which is nice, which we didn't see before. It's the only time. We see the deuterated, but we also see NH4. NH4 plus, we, we measure, in the end, we measure ions. Uh, so that's when I got the idea, maybe uh, this comes from ammonium salt. Ammonium salt, that's how it looks like, for example, for CN. So you have NH4 plus an anion, and uh, ammonium makes very uh, easily salt with, with all kinds of acids. Um, if you look at the literature, if you sublimate ammonium salt, it will break up immediately into NH3 and the protonated anion. So we measured it ourselves in the lab, and what we found, it's true, we get NH3 and HCl, by far the most abundant, but then we get quite a lot of NH2Cl if we do it with NH4Cl. And we get some of the parent, and we get NH4+. So I went back to the space, that's lab, back to the space data, and indeed we have NH2Cn, quite a nice peak, and a much smaller peak for the parent NH4Cn, at the same time when we have NH4. So I think that's the proof that we have ammonium salt, and we have it probably not only for the CN, but also for NH4COOH and NH4OCN. And that could give the black color of the comet, at least some of it. And finally, uh, did comets deliver uh, material to the Earth? I already have said it, I can't show it. Uh, here is the fraction of cometary xenon, which is in our atmosphere. It's around 22%, so that's with the error bars. Now it depends, you have to assume the time when comets delivered it, and how much xenon the Earth has lost by that time, of course. So there are the, the initial atmospheric xenon, it's the red line, and the present-day atmospheric xenon, that would be the xenon we have today, which is much less than we had in the beginning. Uh, but I, I think comets, if they impacted, it was relatively early in the atmosphere of the Earth. So we were closer to the red line, and then you end up with 1 to 2% of terrestrial water. 
And that means, uh, so 10 to the 19 kilograms of water from comets, and organics 10 to the 17 kilograms, roughly, order of magnitude. And this is very concentrated at the location where comets impact. And maybe that's how life was sparked, I don't know. But in addition to these organics, these are volatile and semi-volatiles, you have to add then the Cosima uh, data, the volatiles in the refractories. I don't know if they can react to, to make anything, uh, if they are refractory, but probably yes. So back to my uh, chemistry scheme. From the xenon isotopes and silicon isotopes, I think we can say something about the original interstellar medium, because that's uh, where, where we got these strange uh, isotopes. Sulfur tells us probably about the chemistry in, in the molecular cloud stage. O2, S2, D, D2O, about the, uh, the star forming region here. This tells the presence of CO argon and CH4 tells us something about the, the temperature in, in the protoplanetary disk. The over age, something about how the solar system formed, where comets formed, how much was delivered to the Earth, and finally evolution of life. Maybe looking at xenon and organics tell you something about uh, how life uh, sparked on Earth. So Rosetta, actually 10 years of planning in the 80s, 10 years of design and construction in the 90s, 10 years of cruise phase <laughs> in the 2000, and 10 years of analysis, which will go on for the next eight years. It's already two years done. Uh, and there are still a lot of questions to be answered. And uh, that's the Rosina team. Thanks to the US, we got uh, excellent electronics, I have to say. NASA paid for it. So it's not only Bern, it's not only Europe. We actually got uh, from Lockheed Martin and also from uh, University of Michigan very good hardware. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to the Rosetta team of ESA and uh, the operations team in Darmstadt. With, they did a really great job. Mm. And that's the legacy of Rosetta. As you see, <laughs> there are still some tails and feet and ears because we still have a lot of fragments which we have not yet identified in our data. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Spinning up, and that's yes, it might break up. But <laughs> is, is that not considered just extraordinary? Because no, actually, if, if you calculate it with, with what we have lost and um, with this shape it has, it, it uh, it's about right. So it's, it doesn't have much longer to live. Um, so, unless it unless it spins down. Yeah. Yeah, it could spin down again during the next five years. Of course, but it has a crack in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the beginning. Uh, so, so uh, Caesar, Caesar, the Caesar mission selected for. I hope the comet will still be around. <laughs> okay. Um, two things briefly. One is uh, you showed that the xenon isotopes, if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, carry a signature of their origin, be it the supernovae or AGB stars uh, yeah. or the ISM. And I'm just wondering, it's been conjectured, I think it's aluminum, uh, suggests that the protosolar nebula had been enriched by supernovae. So I'm wondering if the xenon uh, is consistent with that hypothesis. Well, it, it shows you probably that the comet did not get this enrichment, but the sun did. Yeah, that was yeah. 
you see the um, not now we don't I think supernova give you the P process mostly. And we don't see the 124, 126. We can't we can't say anything. We just can uh, this Newton star merger, which gives you the R process, is probably not uh, there for for comets, but for the overall uh, solar system of the sun. So it's the there. story is still a bit fragmented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we also have krypton isotopes. Um, they are much more solar than than xenon isotopes. There's one isotope. Six, which is the second question is uh, in your percentages breakdown of what was delivered to the earth um, do you have reason to believe that the uh, the comet is is homogeneous I mean obviously what you've sampled is the surface layer and in coming up with those numbers of what was delivered to the Earth, you're assuming that that's reflective of the bulk mass. Is, is um, there something in your data that would well, support that? Well, xenon we measured very late in the mission, and xenon comes from the southern hemisphere, together with CO2. <coughs> And the southern hemisphere was during perihelion the summer hemisphere, so it lost between four and ten meters depth in head height. So it's really fresh material, but it could well be that in the core you still have more xenon than it, because you may have lost some. Well, xenon is not that volatile, you know. Argon is, but xenon is not very volatile. It sticks. Things, two balls and whatever. Try it in vacuum chamber. <laughs> okay. So I, I was looking for uh, all of the interstellar molecules, and I was looking for HCO, and I didn't see it. Did I just miss it? Where is it? HCO. Yeah. Um. It, it could well be one of the fragments. You, you know, HCO is for us. It's H two CO, the, the parent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because we fragment H2CO into HCO, so we have to do the mass first to see how much remains after deducting the fragment for H2CO. And all the other uh, methanol and so on. They will all, there is a lot of HCO so mass 29. But it, uh, I don't know if it can be accounted for by formaldehyde or not. Because, because we fragment the means. We are doing it currently for CHs, and there we are sure that we cannot account for all the, the fragments. But we have not yet done it for the old bearing. Um, that's next. Right. Uh, you were mentioning for how dark the comet was in terms of the albedo, that that might be related to the nitrogen bearing species uh, and the depletion of nitrogen bearing species. I was wondering, when you were showing the plot with the, the CHN bearing species, uh, you didn't show any that were um, aromatic. And I was wondering whether you nope. have any constraints on nitrogen bearing aromatics like benzonitrile, or whether that could be part of the like mass CD fragments that are unaccounted for. This year. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you do firmly yeah. rule those out, or is it just that it's not possible? There. It's, it's not there, it's below the detection limit. Okay. okay. We so looked for pyridine, okay. uh, which would be a nice one. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not there. Okay. Any additional questions? Uh, well, last time there was something like one spot still open tomorrow morning, so if you you know, if you have any more questions and you quickly sign on, you might be able to grasp that, that last spot which happened. Uh, should be here until noon uh, tomorrow. But uh, Iris, let's uh, thank Captain again.